Hello, and welcome back to GCSE History Lessons. In this lesson, we will look at the Cuban Missile Crisis. By the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain the events of the Cuban Missile Crisis, as well as the consequences of this crisis. You will remember from previous lessons that the Cuban Revolution of 1960 resulted in a communist government there, led by Fidel Castro and supported by the USSR. This posed a massive threat to the USA, especially since Khrushchev wanted to put missiles on Cuba to pressure the US and give himself an upper hand in negotiations on Berlin. We saw last lesson that Kennedy's attempts to solve these problems resulted in humiliation for the USA. The 1961 invasion to overthrow Castro was a disaster, and in Vienna that same year, Kennedy was humiliated by Khrushchev at the negotiating table. So by mid-1962, we had a situation in the Cold War where Kennedy was determined to prove himself as a strong leader, and Khrushchev wanting to put pressure on the USA to benefit the USSR's bargaining power for issues such as peace in Berlin and the removal of US missiles from Turkey. Although Khrushchev and Castro had agreed to install missiles secretly on the Caribbean island before, by the end of August 1962, America's CIA had hard evidence of anti-aircraft defence systems being developed in Cuba. In September, the CIA monitored the build-up of equipment and troops there, prompting Kennedy to make public warnings on September 4th and September 13th, warning the USSR against placing missiles there. The Soviets assured the Americans that they wouldn't, but on October 14th, a U-2 spy plane brought back nearly 1,000 pictures, which clearly showed medium-range missile bases under construction on the west of the island. Kennedy was informed of this development on the 16th and immediately convened a secret conference of top military, diplomatic and intelligence advisors. This group, called the Executive Committee or EXCOM, met throughout the crisis to agree on issues and get support from the different departments of the government. Kennedy decided that the best way to deal with this threat was to blockade Cuba to prevent any further missiles being sent there from Russia. He announced this in a TV address at 7pm on October 22, 1962. In this address, Kennedy made clear that if any missiles were launched from Cuba against any target in the Western Hemisphere, the US would regard it as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. US nuclear forces were placed on Defence Condition 2 one step away from DEFCON 1, which meant war. Across the world, the President's speech was broadcast. In the US, fallout shelters were made ready, and hoarding began. In the USSR, however, the public weren't told of the nuclear threat. They were informed that an imperialist nation was threatening their socialist brothers in Cuba. In fact, Khrushchev never wished to provoke the USA to such an extent. He admitted to his colleagues... We were not going to unleash war, we just wanted to intimidate them, but now this may end in a big war. On the night of October 22nd, 23rd, the Kremlin gave its commander in Cuba authorization to launch tactical nuclear weapons if the Americans attempted a landing. On Wednesday 24th at 10am, the US blockade of Cuba began. If any Soviet ships crossed the line set up by the blockade, the USA and USSR would engage in all-out nuclear war. Shortly after the blockade was set up, XCOM was informed that two Soviet ships were within a few miles of the line and showed no sign of slowing down. A few minutes later, they learned that a Soviet submarine was positioned between the ships. The US aircraft carrier USS Essex was ready to intercept them. Bobby Kennedy, John Kennedy's brother, recalled, I think these few minutes were the time of gravest concern for the President. His hand went up to his face and covered his mouth. He opened and closed his fists. His face seemed drawn, his eyes pained, almost grey. Then, at 10.25am, the CIA reported that some of the Russian ships had stopped. A short time later, XCOM heard that 20 ships had stopped and turned around. Secretary of State Dean Rusk said, We were eyeball to eyeball and I think the other fellow just blinked. The immediate threat of nuclear war had been averted at the final hour, but tensions were still high. 
Just one slip-up or miscommunication could ignite global nuclear war. The immediate problem for Kennedy was that some of the Soviet missiles were already in Cuba, and the president needed to get them off to ensure US security. This was such a problem that by the end of the weekend, XCOM and Kennedy were leaning towards invading Cuba to get the missiles off. Airstrikes and invasion plans were finalised. 18,000 casualties were expected in the first 10 days of fighting. The superpowers were brought close to war again on Saturday, October 27th, when a U-2 spy plane was shot down by a SAM missile over Cuba and its pilot killed. It's now understood that local Soviet commanders in Cuba had decided to shoot it down, but XCOM assumed the orders came from Moscow. Then, later that afternoon, Cuban anti-aircraft guns shot a low-flying US reconnaissance plane. This time the plane wasn't totally destroyed and made it home. If it was shot down, it's possible that Kennedy couldn't have resisted calls for military action any longer. The Joint Chiefs of Staff were demanding airstrikes by Monday or Tuesday. Thankfully, nuclear war was avoided, but only just. The Cuban Missile Crisis showed how easily leaders could lose control of a situation and how the strategy of brinkmanship, that is, inching closer and closer to the brink of war before backing down to assert dominance, could easily have led to global disaster. It's expected that if nuclear war did erupt, the USA could have launched 4,000 nuclear missiles at the USSR with accuracy. The USSR could respond with only 220, many of which wouldn't reach their targets. For this reason, Khrushchev was never going to risk war. He just wanted to put pressure on the US and hopefully call Kennedy's bluff. On October 26th, Khrushchev sent Kennedy a letter saying that they were both pulling on a rope in which you have tied the knot of war. The harder you and I pull, the tighter the knot will become. He proposed that if the USSR withdrew, the USA should promise not to invade Cuba. Kennedy also privately agreed to withdraw American missiles from Turkey. Since this last detail was private, it seemed that the Cuban Missile Crisis ended in a complete victory for the USA. But both Kennedy and Khrushchev were shaken by how close they came to nuclear war. One key concern both leaders voiced was how slow communications between Moscow and Washington were. In fact, during the crisis, Khrushchev had resorted to using Western journalists and Radio Moscow to give messages to Kennedy. In June 1963, the two countries established a hotline, known as the Red Line in Russia, to provide 24-hour direct communication between the two leaders. Two months later, the USA and USSR also established the Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, which prohibited underground nuclear tests. Britain also signed, but not France. In October of 1963, the USA and USSR adopted the UN Treaty Banning Nuclear Weapons in Space. This was achieved once Russia dropped its opposition to spy satellites in space, now that their Cosmos program was giving results. Therefore, the results of the Cuban Missile Crisis ushered in a new era of detente, or easing hostility, between the USA and USSR. But the consequences were not positive for everyone. Cuba still remained a threat with Soviet conventional troops stationed there. Castro refused to allow the USA to inspect its missile sites because Kennedy never formally promised to not to invade Cuba. The US continued its espionage programs to kill or oust Castro even after the missiles were gone. Despite the crisis being viewed as a victory for Kennedy, he was publicly assassinated in Dallas on November 22nd, 1963. The humiliation of backing down in the face of US pressure, as well as a poor harvest in the USSR in 1963, led Khrushchev to be stripped of his powers and replaced by Brezhnev in October 1964. So, to summarise what we've learned today, to stop the USSR sending more missiles to Cuba, Kennedy announced a blockade which, if Soviet ships breach, would mean nuclear war between the two superpowers. The blockade began at 10 a.m. on October 24th. At 10.25 a.m., the Russian ships turned away and nuclear war was avoided. This was a victory for the USA and a humiliation for Khrushchev. After two U.S. planes were shot 
by forces on Cuba on the 27th, tensions began to finally relax. Consequences of the crisis included a hotline being established between the Kremlin and the White House to allow 24-hour communication between the USA and USSR. A nuclear test ban treaty was signed to restrict underground nuclear tests. A UN resolution was endorsed against putting nuclear weapons in space. The USA withdrew its missiles from Turkey in return for the USSR withdrawing its missiles from Cuba, but kept conventional troops there. The USA promised not to invade Cuba, but never formalised this agreement, as it wished to continue trying to get rid of Castro. Castro therefore refused to allow the US to inspect his bases to ensure no new missiles were put there. Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963. Khrushchev was replaced by Brezhnev in October 1964. Next lesson, we'll look at the lead up to the invasion of Czechoslovakia including reform in Czechoslovakia and the Prague Spring. Thanks for watching. Feel free to like and subscribe and I'll see you next time on GCSE History Lessons.